Uh, we moved here from Los Angeles. Uh, my wife Joy is originally from Charlotte, Illinois, and, and I'm from Los Angeles. Uh, but we've been living in this area for about 55 years now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, I, I, I must say this is a different experience for me. I've given a number of talks over my lifetime, but never about myself. <laughs> so uh, I've, uh, I, I try to prepare this and uh, make it as uh, much to the point and brief as possible. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, about my background. <clears throat> I have a couple. I have some interesting grandparents. I'll start with them. Uh, first of all, my my father's father is from Cornwall in England, and uh, he moved to this country and uh, to attend the Colorado School of Mines, and graduated. And, and then he took a job in Michigan, where happily he he met his his wife, and uh, and. Uh, they had one child, which, which was my father. Uh, then, uh, <coughs> excuse me. Then they, they uh, eventually moved to uh, South Africa, uh, and he took his family with him. And uh, unfortunately, then the, the Boer War started, <coughs> and uh, he was he was called up uh, into the uh, British Army. He was an officer in the British Army during that war. After the war. Then he decided to move back to Michigan, and he collected his his wife and son. Who at that time, we lived in Cornwall, and, and moved back to Michigan. Uh, then uh, he, he proceeded his career as a mine engineer. And uh, then, in 1914, World War One started, and his regiment was called up. Well, uh, it, it was very interesting timing because he taking out his first paper for citizenship in the United States, and, and uh, yet his regiment was called up. So uh, his duty, he felt, was to uh, uh, leave the United States, go back to England, uh, join his regiment, and fight in the war. And, and he had quite a time making that decision, because he was obviously torn between. But, but he did it, <coughs> served in World War I, and uh, eventually was uh, killed in 1918. Uh, when shortly after he left, then my father, who was 16 at that time, decided that, that he was going to go on active duty also. And here he was underage, but uh, somehow he got his grandfather to vouch for his age, and saying he was 17 <laughs> instead of 16. And he joined the U.S. Navy. <coughs> And he served in the U.S. Navy through World War One, and for uh, uh, some years after that, and decided then they didn't want to make it a career, and uh, then uh, he, he moved on. And on my mother's side, uh, uh, she was born in Lodz, Poland, and uh, she was in a family of, of twelve children, and uh, shortly before World War One, then. Uh, her father immigrated to the United States with the intent of, to, of uh, settling down and sending money for transport for the rest of his family. Then World War I intervened, and uh, Lois Quillen uh, was a uh, oh, a fortress city, occupied a very strategic uh, location, and it was it was fought over heavily between the uh, the uh, Russians and the Germans, and. Uh, uh, she, she, she had to move her family out. Uh, it, it, it was actually devastating in the area. <clears throat> I'm sorry? Move your mic closer. Mic closer? Okay. Is this better? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Talk into the mic. And um, so to make a long story short, she, she uh, needed to, to get from Lowe's uh, quite a distance to, to, to the uh, seaport. And uh, she didn't have the tickets purchased. And so what she did is that she took the money that her husband had sent back to her, uh, so sewed it into, into the, the line of her dress, and dressed as a beggar, and, and, and walked to the seaport, and uh, got the tickets, came back. And uh, my aunt, who was the oldest 
child of 16, <coughs> that said that, well, she literally had to step over bodies uh, going back and forth. She came back and uh, collected her 12 children and, uh, and shepherded them over to the port, which again was, was quite a trip, and successfully got aboard the ship and, and became the United States. So at the age of two, my, my mother uh, became an immigrant, went through Ellis Island, and, and so forth. Uh, then, uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, uh, she eventually married my, my father and they settled in Los Angeles, uh, where, where I was born and my brother was born. And uh, <coughs> everything was, was fine until I was three. And, and then my father, uh, as I said, had, had a Navy, career in the Navy uh, for a number of years, and then he, he uh, left. He was a qualified pharmacist by that time and worked as a pharmacist. And, uh, but at the same time, he stayed in the Navy Reserve. He was a, uh, he was a, uh, what's known as a chief pharmacist mate. Uh, his, his duties were really about being a, uh, a head foreman and, and provided uh, medical care. And uh, in the reserve, my father was attached to the Marine Corps. If the Navy provided uh, health care services to the, uh, to, to the Marine Corps. And uh, <clears throat> then in 1940, the Marine Corps Reserve was called up. And uh, he didn't have to go either. <laughs> kind of similar to the, his father's situation that he was 42 years old at that time and uh, well overweight and uh, not in condition to join the Marines. Um, and he didn't have to go because he was over 40. So he faced the floor and uh, decided that his duty was to do that and, uh, and uh, off he went. So he had to go through the Marine Corps training and, and then he was shipped to Iceland um, for strategic reasons. I, I won't go into all the details, I don't have time, but it's kind of an interesting story in itself. And, and so the Marines were in Iceland and uh, uh, under very harsh conditions, as a matter of fact. And, and uh, unfortunately, he, uh, he uh, had a heart attack and became disabled and was uh, shipped back to uh, San Diego and was hospitalized for some time and, and then given a medical discharge. And uh, uh, from that time on, he was partially disabled, but still able to work most of the time. But uh, it, it was uh, quite a quite a process for me to go through. In terms of uh, my upbringing, <coughs> excuse me, uh, the Methodist Church was a, a, a key part of, of my <coughs> excuse me of my education and my development. My father was. Uh, in addition to what I mentioned, was also a lay preacher in the Methodist Church. <clears throat> and um, he, he was quite active in the, in the church. And uh, of course, uh, the, excuse me, the rest of my family uh, necessarily became very active too. So I attended Sunday school. My, uh, my church uh, had a Boy Scout troop. I joined that, eventually became an Eagle Scout and a junior assistant scoutmaster and a scoutmaster. And uh, that was a very important part of my development, certainly, and certainly helped mature me quite a lot at, at a relatively young age. And at the same time, uh, I, uh, I, I had an interest in music, and so I, I uh, eventually joined the church well, thank you, the church orchestra, and, and a number of other things. Um, Sorry. Um, just had a question. You, you did actually answer, um, or get into a little bit about your faith journey. I did want to ask about that. To, sorry, to back up a little bit. Okay. You talked about your father being a preacher, and you growing up in the United Methodist Church. What, what, can you, can you describe for us a bit what your faith journey was like and kind of give us a little bit of context to where to how you arrived here, where you are today in your faith? Yes. 
I was, uh, I, I, I was going to come to that. I was trying to go chronologically here, but uh, <laughs> but be that as it may, I'd like to mention too that uh, my father uh, in the Navy had had uh, in contact with the Salvation Army and had become quite interested in them and was active in them. And, and then uh, somehow or other, as I was growing up, then uh, he 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 got back in contact with them and. Uh, and uh, he and my mother became very active. They were in what's called the uh, jail ministry. Uh, I recall very clearly every Saturday morning at 4.30, the two of them would get up, put on their uniforms, and, and go to the county jail to hold services. And they, they did this, that for, for many years, which certainly impressed me. In addition to that, uh, <clears throat> there was a, a homeless ministry that he was engaged in. And, uh, and he drew me. He drew me into that too. And uh, then I was interested in music, as I said. And uh, and uh, uh, and I, I started to play the trombone when I was very young. In fact, I was so young that the you know, trombone had a long slide in it. And my arm wasn't long enough to <laughs> it was just in So in order for me to to play the trombone, then I, I had to put my foot in the slide <laughs> and, and extend it out. Well, there's a small problem in that the uh, trombone isn't built for that. And, and as a result, I sprang the slide and had to fix it. And eventually I, I, I got bigger and older, and so I didn't have to do that anymore. <laughs> but uh, uh, that that was quite relevant to the Salvation Army because I ended up uh, uh, going to um, services that my father would conduct in the so-called Skid Row area of, uh, of Los Angeles, and, and I, I played the trombone, and, and, and then at times I would uh, play in this a small band at street corners, and uh, you know, comfort with my father, and uh, he, he would try to bring homeless people into the services and provide uh, and, and try to help them uh, uh, take care of their problems and, and get housing and so on. And the process, I also went on summer camps and uh, mainly music camps with the Salvation Army and it certainly brought me in contact with a lot of uh, disadvantaged people, which stood me good stead later. Uh, then, uh, <coughs> excuse me, I graduated from Los Angeles High School in 1955. I was a, a math major, and uh, then I uh, graduated from UCLA in 1958. Uh, I majored in history and political science, and very happily, I uh, I, I married Joy. <laughs> uh, she and I met at UCLA. She was a registered nurse, and. Uh, uh, we certainly hit it off, and uh, and I, I graduated, and shortly after that, we, we got married very happily. And uh, she's been the love of my life, and uh, we're going to celebrate our 60th wedding anniversary in July. Okay, uh, <clears throat> moving on, uh, then, <clears throat> excuse me, what follows it? What follows it? In college, then I signed up for the Marine Corps Platoon Years class, which was a, uh, a, a uh, program of the Marine Corps to, to train uh, college students to become officers. And so I participated in that, and I was flown back here for two summers and, and went through the officer's training, which was education in itself in many ways. And uh, then I, I went on uh, I went on active duty when I graduated in 1958. I had a three-year commitment, and um, then uh, in the meantime, Joy and I got married. And our, our honeymoon was driving from Shelby, Illinois, to Quantico, Virginia. And uh, that was actually all I could afford because by the time I got out of college, after paying the bills and everything like that, and my parents didn't have had the money to do very much, and so I, I borrowed a hundred dollars from my father, and, and I acquired a, a um, gasoline credit card, and, and so our honeymoon was, was driving 
that distance directly and, and, and landing it on the coat. Uh, uh, we, we made up for it some time later when we were, we were better able to uh, to, to uh, handle the expense. <laughs> but uh, anyway, in, in terms of my Marine Corps career, just briefly, uh, uh, while I was in college, then uh, in junior years class, I was also in the active Marine Reserve. I was an infantry squad leader, <coughs> excuse me, and then uh, when I graduated in '58, uh, again we were we were we were transferred back to Quantico, and I spent about seven months there, going through officer's basic school, and, and then we were transferred out to uh, 29 Palms, California, North Mojave Desert, where I I became an, an artillery officer, and I eventually commanded an artillery battery, uh, one five five millimeter self-propelled guns, and that was a fantastic growing experience for me. I was only 23 years old and I had all this responsibility and uh, I, I really enjoyed it. Uh, then I went into the active reserve and uh, I was uh, S3S operations officer on Florida Battalion and, and uh, then became a captain and we moved out here at that time, 1962, and I became uh, uh, the uh, S3 operations officer of infantry battalion. So this experience was absolutely terrific for my development, and uh, and, and there's a saying that uh, once a marine, always a marine, and uh, you have to be a marine to really appreciate that. But uh, there's a lot of truth to that because it's a fantastic uh, experience and background, using a lot of self-confidence too, which is is very important to me. And then in terms of my career, uh, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, I, I, excuse me, I, I joined the federal government in 1962. I was offered a very good job here in the Pentagon, so um, as a federal employee. So we uh, we moved out here, and uh, then I I <coughs> I get on the ground floor of. Um, in terms of the development of uh, what's called planning, programming, and budgeting systems and policy analysis. And uh, uh, so it, it was a great opportunity for me to get involved in, at the early stages of something that was quite new. And, and uh, so I, I spent four years in federal government. Uh, I'll, I'll get a little bit more of that a bit later. And, and then. Uh, <coughs> After the federal government experience, I became a, 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 a consultant and a researcher in, in program analysis and evaluation. And uh, so I, I founded uh, uh, two companies. Uh, one of them was a for-profit company and the other was a non-profit. And we worked under, uh, under uh, uh, mainly, mainly government contracts and grants. Uh, and I, ran this company for a number of years. Yes. Same time I became active in the Operation Research Society of America. I was head of the cost effectiveness uh, section and also the social science application section. And uh, we had uh, more than 50 contracts and grants over a period of about 10 years. <clears throat> and I, I, I authored a number of things, uh, six books, Three monographs and about 80 other publications of various kinds. Um, and then, in terms of educational activities, of all of this was going on, I went to graduate school. And unfortunately, I was offered a scholarship at George Washington for a year, and after that, my employer pick, picked up the uh, cost. But I, uh, I went for seven years to night school while I was working full time. and. Um, um, I got a, a Master of Public Administration degree in 1965, then I got my doctorate in uh, 1969, and, uh, and basically moved on. Um, now I, <coughs> excuse me, uh, I, uh, I'm sorry? Thank you. Um.
Yeah. Am I running out of time? No, 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 no. I just, <laughs> just wanted to, to re ask the question. Okay, so uh, after about 10 years old, then uh, an unfortunate thing happened from my perspective, but anyway, which is that uh, Ronald Reagan became president. And uh, he had a whole different orientation than than the, the source of the, of the funding for my for my, my business. And uh, he wanted to put everything into defense, uh, which, which uh, in many ways a laudable idea. But he cut back on, on all the things that I was interested in doing, having to do with program analysis for non-defense programs. But most of my focus was on programs uh, for for health for disadvantaged people uh, and and uh, programs to prevent drug abuse and uh, programs to prevent child abuse and neglect so uh, uh, the, the uh, money dried up and uh, I thought well I think I better reorient myself and, and at that time my hobby my hobby was uh, investments and so I thought, well, I, I think that there might be a, 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 a profession there for me. So I reordered my, myself, and uh, I could apply quite a bit of the skills that I developed, and, uh, and uh, changed folks from the firm to uh, financial planning and money management. And I became a certified financial planner and started the company. and. Uh, ran it for more than 20 years, and uh, then uh, I, I finally retired at about 10 years ago, and, uh, and, uh, and I sold the company and, and moved on. So let me turn to my, to, to my uh, faith journey and some of the things that I think are, are significant in terms of uh, dealing with uh, uh, with uh, disadvantaged people and, uh, and, and, and social justice. <clears throat> First of all, uh, uh, let me just say that Joe and I became members of North Bethesda about 50 years ago. Hmm. Uh, so we've been here for a, a fair amount of time. I, and uh, I, I had various jobs. Uh, I served as a Chairman of the Council on Ministries at that time, then uh, uh, the uh, what was now the city, the, the was now the Church Council uh, was really divided into two parts: one administrative board and another the Council on Ministries, responsible for all the programs in the church. And, and so I, I eventually became a chair of the Council on Ministries, and then later. When I was through with that, I became chair of the ministry of the board, and then uh, I was chair of staff parish relations uh, uh, under two different uh, ministers, and I was lay representative of the annual conference, and then I uh, I became the portfolio manager for the endowment committee, which is a whole other story that I won't get into unless we have time, and then. Uh, and, and now I'm uh, I'm uh, on the finance committee and the endowment committee. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, th throughout my career, I've had a special interest in, in in helping poor and disadvantaged people. I'm especially interested in in working to uh, help uh, poor people uh, lift themselves out of poverty by providing them. Uh, moral support, training, uh, in some cases uh, health care, and, and so on. Uh, and uh, that has been a very important mission to me, and, and I'm, I'm continuing that. I, uh, I conduct a number of studies that, uh, uh, that had specific recommendations regarding uh, children's programs and health programs, and I helped implement some of them. I've, uh, I, I've worked with a number of local organizations, and to some extent still am, including the uh, Community Foundation, Interfaith Works, Mental Health Association, Chamber of Commerce, and, and I, I, I 
now I'm working in continuum of work, actually with Interfaith Works. I've worked with them now for several decades. <coughs> and um, I'm, uh, I'm referred to as a financial advisor at this point. Um, I stood on the board for a number of years and, and so forth. Um, so I, I, that organization has a, has a very clear focus on social justice, which is extremely important uh, to me, certainly. And I worked with Interfaith Works for many years. Uh, I've, you know, I've been their financial advisor, managing investments uh, for them, and so forth. Um, <coughs> excuse me. I'm currently acting as a financial advisor and money manager with four nonprofit organizations, including, including our church. And uh, I enjoy that very much. And besides that, it, it keeps me occupied. Uh, my vision of retirement doesn't agree with, with the concept of sitting on your front porch in a rocking chair and, <laughs> and serving traffic going by. <laughs> uh, so it's very important for me to do that. And fortunately, Joy feels the same way. And she, she's as active as I am <laughs> in various activities. <clears throat> So let's let's rewind a little bit. You talked about various organizations and nonprofit organizations which you support. With your experience serving on these boards and working with them, what has been your experience surrounding race and equity, and what have you had to learn or unlearn about social social justice and issues surrounding that? Well, excuse me. Well, when I refer to uh, uh, to uh, Populations of, of uh, poor people, people who have the symptom issues or problems that I've studied, then uh, necessarily uh, race becomes a very important focus on. Mm -hmm. And, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, um, as a matter of fact, uh, when I was working for the Office of Economic Opportunity, um, then uh, when, when they first started, that then they they hired me to develop a plan for a budgeting system and program evaluations for them. And, and so uh, I spent a good deal of time uh, traveling to uh, community action programs, which were predominantly focused upon, upon inner cities, and um, did evaluations and made recommendations about how, the, how they might be able to improve their programs. One of the most more interesting experience I had was when I when I went to uh, to Watts area in Los, in Los Angeles. And, and shortly before I, I I went there, then the, the, they had the uh, so-called white Watts riots, which were extremely destructive, and um, <laughs> there were enormous conflicts between the, the black community and the police. Which uh, I know uh, it was happening in a number of cities, uh, but uh, in, in any case, I, I was there and <coughs> the watch riots had been over for quite some time, and I was able to work with a community action program there and uh, to, to evaluate and make, make suggestions. <laughs> and, and then when I was through, I went back to the hotel, <coughs> but went to bed at four three in the morning. I got a call from my boss back in Washington, and he said that, uh, well, Marv, he said, uh, I don't know what I want you to do, but I want you to stay there, looking around, that there had been a, a conflict between some of the black citizens and the police. And so he called me back and, uh, and uh, told me what he wanted me to do, which was to basically go to the Green Action Program and, uh, and uh, uh, we'll work with them to try to, to develop some some programs and policies you know, which would help alleviate the situation. So, so I, I did that. And uh, uh, but in, in terms of social justice, uh, I, I think the uh, one, one of the better programs I've seen in this area is Interfaith Works because they're. They're probably the biggest nonprofit organization uh, in this area, uh, which is which is successfully working to help people lift themselves out of poverty. Okay, so 
Let, let's touch on that a bit then. What, what have you seen through working with Interfaith Works? And what, have, what lessons have you learned from working with them surrounding issues of social justice? Well, I, I, I said, you know, one of the things that, I, that I, I've learned, uh, which I, I, I was aware of before, was, <clears throat> excuse me, the critical importance in working with uh, various existing agencies, uh, primarily the ones that are um, funded by the federal government, or rather the, the uh, county, state, and federal governments, and um, it's just very important to be able to coordinate these various activities and sources of funds and, um, and programs. So uh, that I think is one of, the, one of the really major things that Interfaith Works does, and which I think is just terribly important in this area. Yeah, I think last question for me at least. You talked earlier about your hobbies with music and a lot of volunteering efforts that, you have, that you've done. What other um, interests or hobbies or interests and talents that we may or may not be aware of do you have, or would you like to share? <laughs> okay, well, uh, I like to play golf. <laughs> uh, actually, I've been very, very active over many, many years. And, uh, I was active in all the sports when I was in high school, and uh, then um, I became a, I was, one of them was tennis. I was an active tennis player for about four, 40 years, and uh, then I got to the point where um, I had too many injuries to continue playing, <laughs> playing tennis. As a matter of fact, uh, for me to play, then I'd have to uh, put all this stuff on it. I'd have to, to wrap my ankles, a uh, knee brace, sometimes a thigh brace, an ankle brace and a, an elbow brace. And, and, and Joe would look at me and laugh, and she'd say, you look like you're going to war. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and so one year, to her great credit, uh, she surprised me for Christmas and gave me uh, six golf lessons. <laughs> Just out of the blue. I never played golf before. So, anyway, so I, I thought, well, okay, I'll give it a try. So I, I did. And I and after uh, about a year of trying to play both golf and tennis, I didn't have the time, and so I gave up tennis, took up golf, and I've been very happy with it ever since. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, in terms of, of other other interests, uh, I'm uh, I, I'm very interested in uh, well, I, I major in history and politics as an undergraduate, and. Uh, I've maintained a, 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 a quite an interest in those two areas. So I, I follow politics very closely. Uh, I, I enjoy reading history. Uh, I, I'm very actively involved with my family. I didn't mention that uh, Joe and I have uh, two children and two grandchildren. And we're, we're a very close-knit family. And, and we, we certainly do like it that way. And uh, so, uh, uh, we, we have quite a few activities. Fortunately, the whole family is located within a 20 minute drive of each other. And uh, so we're, we're very blessed, you know, to be able to, to have access to the, the family. And, and I think it works both ways, you know. I think we all do enjoy getting together very much. And uh, that's a very important part of my life. I know it's a very important part of Joy's life. And, 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 and I should mention too that uh, 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 Joe and I worked together for some years when I started my, my companies, and uh, she, she was extremely actively involved and extremely helpful, uh, responsible for the administrative side of the company. And uh, then, uh, <coughs> excuse me, my first grandchild was born, though, she retired. <laughs> <laughs> Not for me. Does anyone else? Anyone in the audience have any questions for Mark? I do. Yes, it's Betty. Mm -hmm. Hi. 
I know that you, you've both given Joy Trout quite a bit. I don't know how much you've talked about that, but you do. Pardon? And I, I also know that you went to play with Scott, didn't you? I know Joy and um, Ch uh, Sandra, Sandra right? go away every on a girls' weekend. And I know you and Scott uh, travel somewhere. And I know a couple of years ago you did some very historic, you do very interesting things on those, uh, those yearly uh, kid, uh, things with your children. And uh, I know you, every chance you get, I know you travel at just about every continent, right? Sure. Uh, well, yeah, I, I think it's fair to say that we travel, we travel quite a bit. We, we, we do enjoy it. We've uh, traveled to uh, all seven continents, you know, including Antarctica. And, uh, <laughs> and, and uh, we, so we have spent uh, quite a bit of, you know, quite a bit of time and, and really enjoyed very much doing that. Um, part of the travel has been uh, related to, to the fact that, uh, excuse me, that I, I used to belong to an international organization called the International Coffee Fellowship of Rotarians, and we have a, a term in a different country uh, each year. And, uh, and, and of course, Joe and I would, would take the time to tour around the country when, when we did that. But uh, it, no, no, we have we have traveled quite a bit and uh, and just thoroughly really enjoyed it. Any other questions? Yeah. Ms. Scott. You have such a nice bass voice. Did you ever sing in the choir? <laughs> <laughs> Well, it, it may be a big voice, but it's not melodious. <laughs> and, and I'm afraid to say that I, I don't play the trombone anymore either. So, but I, I enjoy listening to music. <laughs> and and, and I, I enjoy listening to the choir, too. And, and I'm quite sure that uh, I, I would go and break in the place right today. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Mom.